Hello, this is Patrick Hickey once again from Boerhaby Comprehensive Prince of School. And in this lesson, I want to talk about Fianna Fáil's economic policy from 1932 to 1939. Now, on this slide, I featured Fianna Fáil's Minister for Finance, Sean McEntee. And I suppose uh, his decisions, and of course, uh, devs too, will lead to a worsening of relations between our country and and uh, and Britain. And that's why I, I think this is reflected in this picture here of the unhappy Union Jack. Now, normally I would get students to make out a grid um, comparing and contrasting the economic policies of Fianna Fáil and its predecessors, Cumann and Ail. And the reason I would do this is because I think the best way to look at Fianna Fáil's economic policy, and I hope that's reflected here in these arrows, is that it was the exact opposite in so many ways of Cumann and Ail. So, if you like now, I would pause at this point and have a read through this list it's a checklist of, I think, the main features of Common Nail's economic policy. So you'd have seen now that Common Nail were conservative in outlook. They paid the land annuities to Britain. They were very anxious to keep, good, uh, keep on good terms with Britain. They maintained free trade with Britain. Agriculture, as we saw in a previous presentation, would be the engine to drive the entire economy. Um, there was limited industrial development under Cumann and Ail. Um, very few semi-state companies were established. And as we saw with examples like Adrigal and that poor family that starved to death in 1927, um, their social welfare policy was, was poor also. Now, before you go on to the next slide, um, see how would you get on? Um, would you be able to predict Fianna Fáil's economic policy? Now, consider what I've said. Nearly everything is the opposite of Cumann and Ail. So before you move on, I'd ask you to pause again and see, can you predict what I will say about Fianna Fáil's economic policy? Remember once again, it's nearly always the opposite of Cumann and Ail. So how did you get on? Well, on the Fianna Fáil side, I have Fianna Fáil were more radical. Of course, in a huge contrast to Cumann Ail's conservative outlook. Where Cumann Ail paid the land annuities, Fianna Fáil stopped paying them to Britain. Um, this and other decisions will lead to poor relations with Britain. And I suppose the, the highlight or the, the low light of that will be the economic war, which we're going to have a look at. Fianna Fáil ended free trade. Uh, they also wanted greater diversification in the Irish economy. So for that reason, we'll see more emphasis on industry and setting up semi-state companies. Uh, I suppose the thing they'll be most remembered for in the 1930s was their radical uh, social welfare policy. It's going to be a far cry from, uh, from Cumann and Ailes, that's for sure. Now, I'm going to break these down, uh, either individually or in pairs or in groups. So the first thing I'm going to look at is the fact that Fianna Fáil, under its Minister for Finance, Sean McEntee, were far more radical than Cumann and Ail. So here is Sean McEntee. He was a TD from 1918 to 1969. That's over 50 years. So if any man deserved a long service award, it is Sean McEntee. Now, his economic policy was more radical than Cumann and Ail's. Um, his and de Valera's government introduced protectionism. They put a greater emphasis on Irish self-sufficiency. And for this, they were prepared to allow relations with Britain suffer. Most radical of all was Fianna Fáil's social welfare policy. Fianna Fáil said it would no longer pay the land annuities to Britain. Now, what were they? Well, I suppose beginning in the early 1880s, British governments had started giving loans to Irish farmers to buy their farms from their landlords. Of course, these loans had to be repaid. OK, uh, so under Cumann and Ail and Cosgrave, the repayments continued. Now, from 1932 on, de Valera is in charge and he says, stop, we are no longer paying the land annuities. Instead, 
we will keep the five million and use it to develop Irish industry, uh, much to Britain's displeasure. Also interesting here, um, Fianna Fáil would continue to collect the land annuities from Irish farmers. You know, it's not that they're going to stop or call them off. They would continue to collect them, but the money would be collected, would be spent in Ireland. Under Fianna Fáil, we will see poorer relations with Britain. Um, we will see an end to free trade and, of course, the disastrous economic war. Now, in its first budget, in March 1932, Fianna Fáil put a tariff on over 40 imported products. And, of course, many of those were from Britain. Because of this and the land annuities, the British retaliated by putting a 20% tax on. Again, I'll pause here and give you time to consider. If you wanted to hurt the Irish economy in the early 1930s, what product would you hit? Did you get it? Yes, cattle or Irish beef. So the British now put a 20% tariff on, British, on Irish beef going into the British market. That made it more expensive and I suppose less likely for British people to buy. So began the economic war from 1932 to 1938. Dev retaliated by putting a tariff on British coal. The impact, uh, it was pretty disastrous. I suppose considering Ireland's dependence on agriculture, um, it was the main aspect of our, of our economy. The economic war really hurt it. For example, under Cumberland and Ale, agricultural exports had been about 40 million per year. Under Fianna Fáil, it plummeted to just 14 million. With a collapse in prices and a glut of cattle on the Irish market, Fianna Fáil actually gave farmers a 10 shilling bounty for their calf skins. I suppose it, it's crazy to think that the skin of the calf was actually more valuable than, than its meat potentially. This led to thousands of calf car carcasses being buried or dumped all over the country. It was a very sad time in our history. Now, there was an easing of tensions in 1935 with the signing of the Anglo-Irish Coal Cattle Pact. Here, both sides agreed to reduce tariffs on coal and, I suppose, most importantly, from our point of view, uh, cattle. It also showed a willingness to eventually end the economic war. And end it did in 1938 with the Anglo-Irish Agreement. Now, watch this in Irish history. There are a number of Anglo-Irish agreements, you know, including the one that is our case study, the one on the, the Anglo-Irish Treaty, you know, that, um, that, uh, that Colin signed off on. This is the 1938 version. Now, it resulted from talks in London between British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain and a Eamon de Valera. I can't exaggerate this. It was a great deal for Ireland. Have a look at its main terms. The British would remove all tariffs on Irish goods. We were actually allowed to keep some of ours. Okay, The idea being you know, it would help protect and promote uh, certain Irish industries. Number three. The British will take a once-off payment of 10 million for the land annuities. It should have been 100 million. Now, these land annuities, some of them were due to be repaid, repaid right up to the early 90s, 1970s. That's right, the 1970s. Now the British say, let's move on, give us £10 million, the land annuities are sorted. It was an unbelievable deal. But wait, there's actually more. Britain agreed to return the three treaty ports. Um, again, as you saw in a previous presentation, they were Loch Swilly in Donegal and in County Cork, Bearhaven and Queenstown, or modern day Cove. Now, the 1938 Anglo Irish Agreement can be considered one of Dev's finest hours, you know, given the nature of this brilliant agreement, and it was perfect timing also. 
remember it's 1938 and I suppose it's you know it's widely considered a war is highly likely and of course if if a war did break out between Britain Germany the Allies and the Axis powers it would be nearly impossible for Ireland to stay neutral if the British still had the treaty ports they don't so that will mean Ireland can stay neutral when World War Two happens. Another feature of Fianna Fáil's economic policy was its emphasis on industry. Sean Lemass was the minister in charge. One of the main reasons for ending free trade was that it would help new and fledging Irish companies um, and would also help the sector to grow. It would also help Ireland become, become more self-sufficient. Now a negative impact would see big companies like Guinness move their headquarters to London. The Control of Manufacturers Act in hindsight was not a good idea. Uh, Lamas introduced it to limit foreign ownership of Irish companies. Uh, not surprisingly, this discouraged foreign investment in the country, uh, something that was badly needed. Some positives. In 1933, Fianna Fáil set up the Industrial Credit Corporation, a bank whose main purpose was to provide loans to entrepreneurs and industrialists who wanted to start up. The big plus, however... Fianna Fáil created an extra 50,000 industrial jobs during the 1930s. Fianna Fáil also set up a greater number of semi-state companies. This was very limited under Cumnor Um, I suppose the main example we picked out there was the, the ESB. Now, just to be clear, a semi-state company is where a company is owned by the state. Uh, it happens where, I suppose, maybe if you're if a country is lacking funding or investors, the government itself will set up these companies. Now, what do they include? Well, under Fianna Fáil, sugar factories were opened in Tume, Carlow, Mallow and Thurles uh, to process sugar beet. Bordnamona was also set up again, to take advantage of the country's um, uh, peat resources. Aer Lingus was also founded, and so was Dublin Airport. Uh, years later, Lamas described Aer Lingus as his proudest achievement. Now, I suppose one of the highlights of Fianna Fáil's economic policy was its greater social welfare provision. In this regard, they were far more radical uh, than Cumnor Nail. Under Fianna Fáil, large-scale construction of social houses began. It, it really only took off under, under their watch. It also saw uh, Fianna Fáil put a big emphasis on slum clearance, particularly in Dublin City. Fianna Fáil would help build over 100,000 houses um, during the 1930s, Cumnor Nail, only 20,000 were built. Fianna Fáil also increased social welfare benefits for the unemployed, owners of small farms, pensioners, widows and orphans. Now it's often asked, why has Ireland never had a strong Labour Party? Well, if you look at what I've just highlighted here... Um, and I suppose a lot of Fianna Fáil supporters would say and did say, we are the real Labour Party. We do look after the working men. And I suppose when that's the case, it left very little room for growth for, for Labour in this country. So, to conclude, overall, Fianna Fáil's economic policy was far more progressive than common deals. They certainly did more for the poor. While there were gains in industry, 50,000 new jobs were created, knocking the stuffing out of Irish agriculture as they did with the economic war meant extreme poverty, 
high unemployment and high immigration were still major issues in this country. And it has to be said, by 1939, and this now is 20 years into our independence, uh, Ireland is still a poor and unsuccessful economy. And things are about to take a turn for the worse with the start of World War II, or as it was called in this country, the emergency, and the economic challenges it would bring. Okay, so that's all I have to say on that. Again, uh, thanks for watching.